This is part two of the series on exploring the Sunlit Sea. As I said last week, the Sunlit Sea is a very small part of the volume of the ocean, just a veneer at the surface, yet covers more than two thirds of the surface of the earth. And it is where most of the marine life lives in this photic zone where there's enough light to enable photosynthesis and production of food. Last week we talked about wetlands and um, as part of that, I talked about wetlands as a threatened resource and I had something in there on oil spills at one point and took it out at the last minute because I thought it was getting a bit long and we hadn't had an oil spill in quite a while. Um, but so I deleted the slide on October 1st and on October 4th, we had oil coming into wetlands in Southern California. So uh, I wasn't too prescient on my part to take that out just before we had a big oil spill. But today we're going to talk about something entirely different. It's uh, phytoplankton, which I consider to be the keystones of a healthy ocean. And my definition, the one I like, is from Encyclopedia Britannica, a flora meaning plants of freely floating, often minute organisms that drift with the water currents. And this would include the minuscule cyanobacteria, which can form huge blooms in the sea, as well as the larger sargassum weed that drifts about the surface of the Atlantic Ocean and accumulates on its beaches. So the contribution of the phytoplankton to the health of the ocean come in three ways. The productivity and their position at the food web base, generation of oxygen, and removing carbon from the ocean's upper waters. And <clears throat> talk a little bit about productivity and their position at the food web, because I think that's maybe the most important of those factors, because Phytoplankton lie at the base of the food web. Virtually everything in the ocean uh, nearly either eats phytoplankton or eats something that eats phytoplankton or eats something that eats something that eats phytoplankton. You get the idea. And uh, if we had no phytoplankton, it would be a very different ocean. Uh, few, if any, zooplankton. There would be probably some small seaweed eating fish and far fewer, maybe none, large predators. They're also important for oxygen generation. And um, I suspect many of you have heard this expression, more than half of the oxygen you breathe comes from marine photosynthesizers like phytoplankton. That's often repeated and it's not accurate. And the reason is that yes, photosynthesis by the phytoplankton do release oxygen as part of the process and they make glucose as part of that process but to use that for growth it has to be converted back again and that involves respiration which requires the consumption of oxygen so oxygen is released in, in um, photosynthesis but it is taken back up again in respiration not only by plants but all of the animals in the ocean also are consuming this oxygen and they're not putting any back. NOAA says it's important to remember that although the ocean produces at least 50% of the oxygen on earth, roughly the same amount is consumed by marine life. And this is sort of reflected in a study that was done just after the beginning of this century by an international group that looked at the balance of oxygen, the oxygen budgets on land and in the sea. And they concluded essentially that the amount that was released by photosynthesis was pretty much consumed by respiration. And even if it weren't, the air we breathe comes from this vast reservoir of atmosphere in which there are various estimates, but all around two quadrillion metric tons of oxygen in the atmosphere. And the yearly oxygen production converted to metric tons is about a sixth of a percent of the total atmospheric oxygen. So a long way from the 50 to 80% that sometimes is claimed for the 
air we breathe. But nearly all the air we breathe is a product of photosynthesis and it began some two and a half to three billion years ago. And um, I think the accurate statement is more than half of the oxygen produced annually on the planet comes from marine photosynthesizers like phytoplankton. And that's really important for the oceans. Phytoplankton also remove carbon from the ocean's upper waters. And we'll talk more about that as we, we go along. So we're gonna talk about three different phytoplankton um, groups, diatoms, dinoflagellates, and coccolithophores. And we're gonna start with the diatoms. Some 20 to 30,000 living species. There are a lot of different species. And most of them are really tiny, microscopic. Uh, they range in size from about 500 microns to two microns, which you can see compared to a grain of table salt is, is really pretty small. And they occur in an absolutely stunning variety. It's, a, it's astonishing. And all of these shapes are shapes that diatoms take. And that just blows me away. I can, I, I can hardly imagine a single group of organisms taking on this kind of uh, uh, variety. And some of them form colonies, probably to reduce predation by grazing. And uh, some of these colonies are really spectacular. Not all diatoms are planktonic. There are some that live on rocks or shells. Uh, whales commonly have dense growths of biotom diatoms on their skin. They occur both in marine and fresh water. In fact, they occur just about wherever there's water, from the open sea to lakes and ponds, to wet mud to the damp, low areas of an otherwise barren desert. They're unicellular organisms, single cells, and they have two valves, typically one that fits inside the other, kind of like a Petri dish, if you remember some of the chemistry in your past. And the valves are made of silica, which is a form of glass, but they're not really made of window glass. Instead, they are made of opal, but sadly, not fire or precious opal, but rather a common amorphous opal, and a little bit more on this later on in the talk. They are really important in terms of productivity. They count it's estimated for up to 45% of the ocean's productivity and perhaps a fifth of the planet's total productivity. So they're really important in that regard. And they have a remarkable reproductive cycle. At first glance, it doesn't look that remarkable. Um, it, their primary approach is simple fission uh, where its shells break apart or the valves break apart and each one grows a new inside valve. And what this means is one is the same size as the parent, but the other one is smaller than the parent. And with time, there'll always be one the same size as the parent, but the rest of them get smaller and smaller. And after six days, which is the average lifespan of a diatom, if they all survived, you'd have one the size of the original and the rest smaller and some quite a bit smaller. So do they just keep getting smaller and smaller until they finally disappear? No, what they do is when they get to about a third of the size of the original diatom, they switch gears from the asexual reproduction, the fission, uh, cloning, and they go into sexual reproduction. They produce sperm that swim in the water and seek out the ova that are emitting pheromones and uh, they enter the um, old set of valves and make mad passionate love. Well, I don't really know about that, but I do know that they unite and they form a new organism that grows inside the old valves and eventually just casts them off. And then they continue to grow inside an expanding sphere that only ruptures and there is a diatom the size of the original. 
And as remarkable as this is, it's not the full story. Diatoms are flora, plants, and they require nutrients like phosphorus, potassium, nitrogen. And in fact, their existence is really tied to the presence of nutrients. When there are lots of nutrients in the water, we have a boom in the diatom population. When there are few nutrients in the water, they don't have many diatoms. It's a bust situation. So they live this boom or bust existence. So during a boom, the nutrients are consumed by the diatoms and eventually they get depleted in the surface waters. And then, oh no, the nutrients are gone. What's a diatom to do? Well, what a diatom does is convert itself into a resting spore. And the resting spores have a bit more silica in the outer shell than do the others which makes them a little bit heavier. So if we go to a situation where we've got a, lots of nutrients and there's a bloom, a boom situation, but the nutrients get consumed and eventually there are not enough of them. So the diatoms convert to spores and the spores settle through the water, come to rest on the seafloor. And there they can sit for up to a hundred years, just waiting for the right conditions to bring them and the nutrients back to the surface where they reconvert to diatom cells and start the process all over again. Well, this works fine in shallow water, but what about the open ocean? There the seafloor is two to three miles below and any resting spore that settles that far is never gonna make it back to the sun-rich sea. What the diatoms do is take advantage of the pycnocline, which is a density boundary between the warm water near the surface, which has a low density, and the cold water of the deep, which has a high density. It's a relatively sharp boundary, and the resting spores are heavier than the warm water and they're lighter than the cold water, so they accumulate along that boundary. And there they sit, waiting until there is an upwelling event or a turnover and they come back to the surface and we're back to a boom situation. You can spot diatom blooms in the bay commonly because the waves churn, the, uh, get churned up in sort of a yellow foam that forms yellowish slicks on the beaches. Diatom blooms in Antarctica are huge and they attract a myriad predators. And chief among these are the copepods, little one-eyed um, crustaceans. And they can consume, a single one could estimate it could consume 350,000 diatoms in a day. But the diatoms are not defenseless. An injured diatom releases a chemical substance, aldehyde, into the water. We use aldehydes as a perfume, as a their scent in the perfumes. And um, other diatoms detect this and they start producing and releasing. And it's not because they like the smell of Chanel number no. five in the water, or really because it impacts the adult copepods, because it doesn't harm the adults, but it damages their reproductive capacity. It interferes with hatching success and the development of the copepod larva. It's like chemical warfare where the enemy is gassed, doesn't know it, but its children are destroyed. How insidious is that? And if too much aldehyde is released, it kills the diatoms off in what's been called a mass diatom suicide, surely a tragedy of Shakespearean proportions, or maybe not. The diatoms do die and they settle to the bottom and they form something that scientists call, and I'm not making this up, diatom ooze. And it can be really thick. It can be off Antarctica. Wikipedia estimates that the diatom ooze can be up to a half mile thick. And diatoms also prosper in marginal seas like the Gulf of California. And these are three sediment cores taken through the sediment 
and you can see the layering of the beds. And all of those light colored layers are diatom remains. Back about 12 to 15 million years ago during the middle Miocene epoch, Southern California and Central California was divided into a series of marginal seas. And in these seas, diatoms abounded just in tremendous numbers. And they settled to the bottom along with mud and under pressure, this was turned to rock. And you can see this rock around Monterey is the light colored tanned buff rock that's layered. This is the Monterey formation formed by the diatoms 12 to 15 million years ago in these marginal basins. And the Monterey formation underlies a uh, significant part of central and southern California. The diatoms, when they settled to the bottom, not only carried the silica in their tests or shells, but they also carried the carbon that they had. And that carbon under heat and pressure became converted to the oil and gas that forms the base of California's petroleum industry. They also formed something else. In this NASA photograph, just in up from point conception, there's a white spot. And this is a series of scars in the surface of the earth. And these scars are diatomite quarries. These are quarries of nearly pure diatom remains. And as the diatom die and start decaying, they break up the um, kind of opal that forms the shells, converts to other forms of opal. It's a complicated process, but notice how many open spaces there are in this material. And those open spaces get retained in the rock, tiny little pores that very quickly absorb liquid. So if you put a piece of diatomite on your tongue, it's going to stay there. And the only thing that's dumber than a bunch of geologists in a diatom quarry with a piece of diatomite hanging from their tongue is listening to them try to talk. Yep, been there, done that. This absorbent quality makes diatomite a very useful product for a whole bunch of things. Kitty litter, swimming pool filters, a uh, bed bug killer. Uh, I don't know about that, but I do know that without diatoms, Mother Teresa very likely would not have won the Nobel Peace Prize. And the reason I say that is it goes back to the mid 1800s when a Swedish chemist named Alfred Nobel was trying to find a stable explosive. And he mixed the unstable liquid nitroglycerin with all sorts of things and nothing worked until he tried it with diatomaceous earth. And when he did that, when he mixed it with diatomite, it worked. He called his, sub, his the product dynamite. It was the basis of his fortune. So no diatoms, no diatomite, no diatomite, no dynamite. No dynamite, probably no Nobel fortune or Nobel prize. The diatoms for all of their beauty and utility have a uh, dark side, especially the genus Pseudonychia. And Pseudonychia produces domoic acid, which is a substance that gets into the food chain and causes something that impacts human called amnesic shellfish poisoning. And whoops. And this can involve, and it's rarely fatal, but it does cause permanent short term memory loss, seizures, coma all from eating shellfish that had filtered out diatom cells that were, were toxic with domoic acid. The Santa Cruz Sentinel in August 18th, 1961, ran a story, seabird invasion hits coastal homes, thousands of birds floundering in streets. Residents, especially in the present pleasure point in Capitola area, were awakened about 3 a.m. today by the rain of birds slamming against their homes. Startled by the invasion, residents rushed out on their lawns with flashlights and rushed back inside as the birds flew toward their light. My goodness, you could make a movie about this. And Alfred Hitchcock did. 
I don't know that Suda Nietzsche is listed among the credits for the movie, but it should be because it's generally considered the domoic acid poisoning was the cost of that bizarre behavior, the sooty shearwaters that uh, attacked those communities. Datoms appeared on the scene after the great crisis that he ended the Paleozoic era, fairly early in the uh, Mesozoic, uh, shortly after the non-avian dinosaurs appeared. And unlike the non-avian dinosaurs, they survived the crisis at the end of the Mesozoic and are very important components of our world today. So that pretty much does it for diatoms. And now we're gonna switch over to dinoflagellates. And dinoflagellates are single celled organisms that are mostly microscopic. Um, the smallest ones get really quite tiny, but the biggest ones can get up to almost two millimeters across, which means that uh, you could see them in a glass of water. And, uh, you know, I'm not quite as thirsty as I was a minute ago. There are about 2,000 species and 90% of them are marine and most of them are planktonic, although there are some who live in the sand just beneath the seafloor. They are protected by a cellulose case, which is a structural protein that makes up wood and plant walls, uh, just all kinds. And they get their name, dinoflagellate, from whirling whips, two whips or flagella that they use to move through the water. And they don't move very fast, maybe a half a millimeter per second, but with time, they can move like eight feet an hour vertically, and they are part of the vertical migration that the, the plankton undergo on our coast here. The reproduction can be simple or it can be incredibly complex. Simple is just cloning, basically, fission, producing a new one. And they can do this under favorable conditions basically every half hour, which means if at dawn on a summer day, you had 10 dinoflagellates in a liter of water, when you came back at sunset 15 hours later, if they all survived and they all replicated, there would be more than a billion dinoflagellates in that liter. Well, that wouldn't happen because they wouldn't all survive and they wouldn't all reproduce, but they can form really dense concentrations. This is a dinoflagellate in a, a water sample, and they can turn the water red, as we'll talk about later. Two mil, 20 million cells per liter, so lots and lots of them in the water during a bloom. Like the diatoms, they have ways of dealing with unfavorable conditions. Um, under favorable conditions, it's just the simple fission, uh, cloning essentially. But if conditions get unfavorable, they go into a sexual reproduction, a, a fusion that produces an organism that can go into the sediment and hibernate. And it can stay there for a long time until conditions are good. Then it breaks out and, and joins the water column and starts the process all over again. And this is the life cycle diagram of a single dinoflagellate. And I'm not even going to try to explain what's going on here. Just recognize it can be very complex. One of the amazing things about dinoflagellates is some one of the families has something that looks very much like eyes. Now, our eyes are complex structures. They're made of tissue that it forms irises, a pupil, a cornea, lens, retina, all of this um, put together to create image. Well, di this family of dinoflagellates has something very much like a cornea, a lens, and retina. And the amazing thing is 
This is all in a single celled organism, which is, I just, I'm blown away by this. So why do they have the ability to form an image? Well, it turns out the metadinium is a predatory dinoflagellate, which brings up another problem, which is lies in the science of classifying organisms. And dinoflagellates are kind of taxonomic troublemakers. Uh, the way I learned it was phytoplankton were the plant drifters, zooplankton were the animal drifters, phytoplankton made their food, zooplankton ate their food. And dinoflagellates show up in both of these. About half of them make their food, and the other half eat their food. And uh, this is one of the predatory dinoflagellates, Oxorus, and it eats phytoplankton, it eats other dinoflagellates, it eats coccolithophores. Times are tough, it'll eat members of its own species. It can take on prey as large as itself. It's been observed to approach and pounce on prey, prey and it can respond to chemicals that are exuded by the prey. Pretty sophisticated. This is a carlodinium, and it releases toxins to capture its prey. Other dinoflagellates shoot a hollow spear into their prey and suck them up as through a straw. And that's what's going on with this unfortunate polychaete larva. These the little round spots are all dinoflagellates that are consuming it. So dinoflagellates fall into a group. They're not really plants and they're not really animals. The group that is called protists, a term that has sort of gone up and down in terms of, of favorability. But although only half of the species photosynthesize their food and the other half are parasitic or predatory, they're second only to diatoms in marine productivity. And sometimes that productivity gets out of hand in the form of red tides. We humans like our beaches nice and clean with lots of clear water, places we can go and splash the waves. Beaches are not always like that. Florida, 2018, had all manner of fish and other things like sea turtles washing up due to a red tide caused by a dinoflagellate. And was described as the worst red tide in over a decade. Now, that's an interesting photograph because does anybody beside me suspect that maybe it was not taken in Florida? Oh, well. What happened in Florida was bad enough. People were not allowed to go into the water. It hit the uh, local economy hard. Stores closed because there weren't any tourists coming in. And you didn't have to go in the water to have a problem. The Pensacola News Journal ran a story that people in red tide areas can experience varying degrees of eye, nose, throat irritation just from the stuff that was windblown. And although when a person leaves the area, the symptoms usually go away quickly. But if you've got a chronic respiratory condition like asthma or chronic lung disease, they caution you to stay out of areas with an active red tide. You don't have to win the water. So red tides are really large. There's a shift of scale and you can see the boundary of this dinoflagellate bloom. And uh, that 2018 red tide off Florida was visible from space. And we've seen this before, but 20 million cells per liter, real concentrations of them. And some species secrete a toxin. This particular species secretes a brevatoxin. And a brevatoxin is designed really, it seems to regulate the salt content in areas where the salinity is fluctuating. But it also has an awful effect when it gets into the food chain. And um, it produces a neurotoxin that in us cause something called paralytic shellfish poisoning. And the toxins contained in a single shellfish can be fatal and there are no known antidotes 
Not only that, it's tasteless, odorless, and heat and acid stable, which means it's really hard to detect and you can't remove it by typical food preparation pro uh, procedures or processes. And it can be devastating. In 1987, in the village of Champerico, Guatemala, 187 people came down with these symptoms and 26 of them died. Are they more dangerous than sharks? Well, a book published in 1993 said, on a global scale, close to 2,000 cases of human poisoning through fish or shellfish consumption are reported each year with a 15% mortality, that's 300 deaths. You compare that to the deaths of four to six a year on average from shark attacks, and it's pretty clear that dinoflagellates are more dangerous than sharks. But they also produce something that's truly spectacular, and that's bioluminescence, the lighting up the sea at night, sometimes called sea sparkle. And it's done by the biggest of the, uh, of the dinoflagellates. This is one that was in that glass of water that I showed earlier. And um, it produces just some amazing flashes in the sea. Uh, I suspect that many of you have seen this. And with all my time in, on, and under the sea, I've never seen it. But it is truly spectacular. And it's not uncommon on the central California coast. This remarkable photograph, that's the Bixby Bridge on the left. So why did they do it? What's the advantage is there to sea sparkle? Well, you'll notice here that it's related to water turbulence. It's occurring where the waves are breaking. So where there's a disturbance in the water is where the sea will light up. And you can see here, it's lighting up along specific places. And these are probably where predators on the dinoflagellates are swimming through the water. But as they light up the water, they become visible to their predators. Sort of like this. And so that may be the reason that we have this spectacular, beautiful sea sparkle. Dinoflagellates are also important in another beautiful part of the sea, and that is coral reef, where they combine, they have sort of a, an amazing union with cnidarians. Cnidarians are jellies and, and anemones. And in the coral reefs, the stony coral reefs have cnidarians that form the coral structure itself. And they have a symbiotic relationship with the um, dinoflagellates. And if you've ever dived on a coral reef, they are just, they're one of the most beautiful places on the planet. So the coral polyps take in basically what are called zoanthellae, but they're really little forms of dinoflagellates of the species Symbobididium, which when it's free swimming has all the necessary flagellum flagella, but when it is ensconced in the coral, it loses that. It's just sort of ground spheres that sit there. And they have this symbiotic relationship whereby they are provide, they provide food for the coral. And in return, they're protected by the coral. And the coral releasing things like nitrogen in the water provide some of the nutrients that the dinoflagellates require. So it's a nice symbiotic relationship. It goes back a long way. Um, corals themselves go back hundreds of millions of years, but the stony corals, the reef building corals, only show up after that great extinction that ended the Paleozoic. And so they, they all date from about the same time um, in the Mesozoic, as do the dinoflagellates. That also probably go back in time, just a little hard to tell because they don't make great fossils, but we do know that they came into their own in the early Mesozoic, about the same time that the stony corals were developing. And it's suggested that it, there's a relationship here that the evolution of the dinoflagellates and their growth allowed 
this symbiotic relationship with the stony corals, all at about the same time. So that is the story of, of our stony coral reefs. But this relationship is not without its problems. And the problems come from the fact that when it gets too warm, the dinoflagellates stop producing food. Not only that, but there are suggestions that they can produce a toxin that's toxic to the coral polyps. And when that happens, the coral polyps eject the dinoflagellates. And since they're the ones that are giving the coral its color, the coral turns white and bleaching. And it can survive for a while, but if it doesn't regain those polyps, it will ultimately die. So is that the end? Does a warming ocean that we see today mean the end of coral reefs as we know them? I think not, because there have been really warm periods in the past, and the coral reefs, the stony coral reefs, have survived those. But probably they did it by moving to higher and higher latitudes, colder and colder water. So our magnificent coral reefs that we have today, unless we change the trajectory of, of ocean temperature, probably are not going to survive. So dinoflagellates, complex tiny drifters, um, algae, phytoplankton, zooplankton, all three. They're important members of the food pyramid. They can be nasty, they can be deadly, they can be beautiful. And they are vital members of coral reef communities. So we can check off dinoflagellates. And go on to coccolithophores. Coccolithophores are characterized by tiny plates called coccoliths that cover their body. So the coccolith is the plate, the coccolithophore that the plates cover is the living organism. And as a group, these are the smallest of the three phytoplankton that I'm talking about here. But they can form giant blooms. We'll talk more about these later. There are about 200 known species and all but one of them is marine. And most of them photosynthesize, but some may also absorb organic matter, but they're true phytoplankton. And the coccolithophore blooms are prevalent at lower latitudes than are those of the diatoms and dinoflagellates. So they don't occur in the same areas. And uh, they seem to be able to tolerate warmer water better than the other um, phytoplankton. So they produce food in places that um, other Organisms don't, where they seem to be able to get by on fewer nutrients than the diatoms and dinoflagellates. So they, the, all of these factors put together means that they could provide sustenance for organisms who would otherwise lack food uh, because they're not in areas where you get the big blooms of the dinoflagellates or the, the diatoms. They are mostly drifters, but some have flagella that can swim to stay in the faultic zone. The living forms take a, a variety of types, but the one that's most common in the sea is this small, simple one, Emiliania huxleyi. And we'll be looking at it more as the, in the slides down the line. It's a small, and you can see how small it is here with the little specks at the end of the arrows, but it's a very abundant coccolithophore and is responsible for this bloom in 1998. Okay, coccoliths. These are the plates that cover the coccolithophores and they're made of calcium carbonate, which is the stuff of seashells. <clears throat> 
and uh, they surround themselves with up to 30 or so of these coccoliths. They're produced, the coccoliths are produced inside the cell and then extruded to the surface. Some of them can produce two to seven coccoliths every day. And some species just continuously produce and shed coccoliths. Some species have both coccolith bearing and coccolith absent form. And uh, Emiliana hoxii, the most common one, has still a third form which doesn't have mobility and it doesn't have coccoliths. And we'll talk more about this as we talk about their reproduction. So why do they have these coccoliths? What, what's the purpose? What do they do? Well, obvious, most obvious possibility is protection, both against viruses by sealing up the coccoliths for, or protecting it from raising predators. But it also could serve an adjustment of light. Calcite <clears throat> as a mineral is transparent. It has some weird optical properties like this double refraction where you see double images when you, when you look through it. And it's postulated that it could be used as a lens to concentrate light when it's dark or to block light if it's too, too bright. Another possible use would be buoyancy. By adding coccolis, a coccolithophore would, get heavy, would, be, would be heavier and sink in the water. On the other hand, if it wanted to go up, it could dump some of the coccolis, become lighter, and get back into more sunlit water. The coccolis may factor in reproduction, although it's a little unclear. Um, coccolithophore re reproduction is, is really pretty complex, and, and there's not a whole lot known about it except for Ameliana huxleyi. And Ameliana huxleyi has these three forms. And if we start with the form that has the coccolis, they replicate themselves, they clone themselves, but they also can divide and produce something like male and female offspring that lack the coccolis, but have the um, ability to move around. And these can replicate themselves. They can clone themselves as well. And if a male and female come together, they fuse and create the third form, which has neither the uh, flagella or the coccolithophores, but it rather quickly starts growing coccolithophores and then gets back into the cycle. And um, this process of replicating itself in both phases means you can create an awful lot of coccolithophores in a short period of time. And uh, these, they can create huge blooms. And these blooms, the trillions of coccoliths in the water with, um, can turn the water color, this, this very distinctive uh, opaque turquoise color. About six years ago, we had a, a large coccolithophore bloom in Monterey Bay, and it did change the color of the water, and some of you may remember that. Coccolithophores arose along with the other of our um, planktons, um, just following the great extinction at the end of the, the Paleozoic. And the coccoliths that are produced are different. They change all the time. And so there's a almost untold number of different styles of coccoliths, each with its own particular time frame. So they are really remarkable in for paleontologists to establish the age of a sediment. These examples here span nearly 200 million years of geologic time. And they accumulate on the seafloor in great numbers, in great quantity. And uh, eventually, if enough of them pile up, it makes chalk. And the cliffs of Dover are nothing more than a massive accumulation 
of Cocculus. The Great Pyramids of Giza are usually taken or commonly taken as a standard of human, human antiquity at uh, 3600 BC. But if you go back some tens of thousands of years earlier, humans were using chalk as a pigment in the cave paintings. And there are chalk mines scattered around England and Europe. And I probably used chalk, maybe real chalk at blackboards when I was in grade school. And, uh, but today all the chalk that's used on blackboards is made of gypsum, something entirely different. Still called chalk. But... And coccoliths are composed of calcite and calcite is calcium carbonate. And carbon is really the root of acidification. So we're gonna talk a little bit about ocean acidification and the role of the uh, of coccoliths and coccolithophores. As we talk about ocean pH, what it is, how it's produced and what it means. It starts with carbon dioxide. It's, carbon dioxide is a rare gas in the atmosphere, not much of it, but because of its greenhouse capabilities, it has a profound effect on our climate. And when it dissolves in water, it has another totally different, but also very important effect. And that is, it unites with water to form carbonic acid. But if you go out in the ocean looking for carbonic acid, you're not gonna find it because it's highly unstable and almost immediately breaks down into a carbonate ion and two hydrogen ions. And those two hydrogen ions are the primary factor in ocean acidification. And a little bit of basic background, a hydrogen atom is one proton, one electron. They balance each other out so there's no electric charge, but a hydrogen ion has lost its electron. And so it has a proton and it has a positive negative, a positive electrical charge. This is an oxygen atom, eight protons, eight electrons, and no electrical charge. And water is simply two hydrogen atoms that are bonded with an oxygen atom. Again, there's no electrical charge because the 10 protons balance out the 10 electrons in the water molecule. But, if a hydrogen ion breaks loose and leaves a water molecule, then the water molecule gains an electron. It's out of balance. And it becomes a hydroxide ion, which is a hydrogen atom that's bonded with an oxygen atom. And it has, and the, the two have an extra proton, which means it's got a one minus one negative charge. So these two things, the hydrogen ion with a positive electric charge and a hydroxide ion with its negative electrical charge are the primary factors in what we think of in terms of alkalinity or acidity and pH. Because it's a ratio of these two ions that determines a liquid's pH. In distilled water, there are equal numbers of hydrogen and hydroxide ions, and it's just arbitrarily assigned a neutral pH of seven. Battery acid, on the other hand, nearly all hydrogen ions has a pH of one or less, and liquid drain cleaner at the other end of the scale, which is mostly hydroxide ions, has a pH of 13 to 14. And things we know of about well, common substance like milk, with lactic acid is slight, slightly more hydrogen ion, ions than hydroxide. So it's got a pH that's around six. <clears throat> Seawater just is sort of in the opposite direction with a few more hydroxide ions than hydrogen. 
And so it's got, it's a little bit alkaline or basic uh, to about the same degree that milk is um, acidic. And so acidification, what we're really talking about is a change in the pH of seawater that goes from where it is today at about 8.2 down to about 8.05 to 7.75, um, a range that we're not sure where it's gonna end up, but still not acidic, it's still basic. It's just less, or alkaline, it's just less alkaline than it was before, but there are other consequences. So anyway, these two, the point of all this is that these two um, hydrogen ions that are produced when carbon dioxide dissolves in water are a primary driver of ocean acidification. But there's also another factor and that is the other product of carbonic acid dissociation is a carbonate ion. And the carbonate ion, if it unites with the calcium ion, forms calcium carbonate. This is the stuff of shells. But, and it also can form with a hydrogen ion forming bicarbonate, which is useless for shell formation. So the carbonate could either unite with a carbon, I'm sorry, calcium, forming calcium carbonate, which is, can be used in shell making, or it can unite with a hydrogen ion forming bicarbonate, which is useless for shell formation. And with all of the extra hydrogen ions that are in the water because of the increased solution of carbon dioxide, the carbonate gets pretty much soaked up by the hydrogen ions and there's not enough left to make shell formation. And um, this is something that's, that's happening already in places like Willapaw Bay, where there's been no natural oysters set in that bay since 2005. That's one of the consequences. Well, coccoliths are composed of calcium carbonate. And they remove carbon from the upper shallow seas because when they're shed, they drift down into the deep sea. And they can deliver a huge amount. Um, this estimate was about one and a half million tons of calcite, calcium carbonate, delivered every year into the deep sea. So it's a significant way of removing carbon from the surface water. And the whole carbon cycle is really complex. It's the it, carbon dioxide dissolves in the ocean, it's consumed by photosynthesis, but released by respiration. It's removed from the upper ocean by the formation and settling of coccoliths. And, um, but you also have not only the coccoliths settling down, but in at the pressures in the deep ocean, they dissolve. So they go back into solution, but at least that's down in the deep ocean, unless you've got an area of upwelling that can come back up. And so in addition to the physical carbon pump taking the carbon down, if you remember the story of the, the um, uh, diatoms and the hydrocarbons that we have here in California, a significant amount of carbon is removed just in the organic material of the skeletons of these tiny drifters. So the ocean carbon cycle is really a pretty complex web and I don't think we're we're really close to understanding it. But coccoliths are composed of calcite, which means they're dissolvable in acid. So what about the effects of acidification on them? Well, early studies showed that there was a negative effect on the coccolithophores with increasing temperature and carbon dioxide. But other studies rather surprisingly showed that the um, coccolith production and biomass of Melania huxleyi uh, 
increase significantly in slightly more acidic water. And there have been a bunch of experiments that have gone on that have shown that if you look at coccolithophores, this is a coastal one subjected to water with an acidity equivalent to that of the oceans in the pre-industrial revolution as it currently exists and what's predicted for the end of the century, you see there's no particularly negative effect by the end of the century. Another study looked at the effect of light level and carbon dioxide on Emiliana Huxleyi biomass. And the upper two of these four photos were developed under, they were, they were up, produced under dim light. And the ones down below were subjected to bright light. And they grew, you could clearly see the effects of light on the growth of the coccolithophore. The ones in blue were subjected to carbon dioxide levels at present, and the ones in red subjected to elevated carbon dioxide, and there's no real difference. So the effects of ocean acidification right now, I'm afraid I'm gonna have to punt. But we can talk about coccolithophores in a warming ocean. And um, <clears throat> the temperatures were really high during the geologic period of the Cretaceous, and also there was a spike in the lower part of the Cenozoic. And both of these correspond to periods where there were a greater number of coccolithophore species. But does the number of species really tell you anything about how successful and how abundant the coccolithophores were in the ocean? Does it, the number of species really equal success? So if we look at the Cretaceous, the period that ends the Mesozoic, it gets its name, it got its name back in 1822, and it was derived from the Latin Crita, which in Latin means chalk. And the area of that today would be Europe was pretty much shallow seas at the latitudes where coccoliths bloom today. And um, that was when the, the coccolith accumulations occurred that produced the cliffs of Dover and chalk basically all over Europe. It, whoops. North America was split by a large seaway that extended across the continent. And in that seaway, chalk accumulated in Colorado, in Kansas, in Texas. Chalk is really abundant, which means the coccolithophores were really abundant in those waters as well. So they were doing really quite well in the Cretaceous with the warmer temperatures of the Cretaceous. Well, what about this Cenozoic spike? What do we see there? Well, turns out there are chalks of that age around different places in the world as well. So it looks like, oh, in Monterey Bay during that um, episode, when we had the large coccolith or bloom, um, was a time of exceptionally warm water. So they seem to be, an organism is really well equipped to handle warmer temperatures. And um, so they might be much more important in the ocean's food web of the future. But there's some questions about this because they're so small that they may not be effective food for everything. And the bloom in the Bering Sea in 1998, um, they were too small to be a food for krill, the little shrimp-like creatures that are the main food of salmon. And in 1998, the Alaskan salmon did not spawn. So they can have broad effects. And one of the questions that I've wondered about as I put this together was, could they be the reason for what's called the ichthyosaur enigma. Ichthyosaurs were marine reptiles, kind of shaped like fish, but lived in the sea uh, during the Mesozoic with their 
reptilian cousins of Pliosaurus, Mosasaurus, and Plesiosaurus. And these latter three all went extinct at the end of the Mesozoic, in that crisis that ended the reign of the dinosaurs. But the ichthyosaurs became extinct before that, and that's always puzzled paleontologists. And um, there's a question. Um, could it be that the food chain changed so dramatically during that particular time that the food that the ichthyosaurs survived on uh, just wasn't available? And that was what contributed to their demise. So we don't know what the future holds as the ocean changes and potentially the food web changes. Well, one last twist. And that is, when is a coccolithophore bearing organism not a coccolithophore? Well, this looks like a coccolithophore. It's got coccoliths all neatly arranged and organized on the outside of the body, but it's not a coccolithophore. It is a tintinid, a predatory zooplankton that feeds on coccolithophores. And it takes the coccoliths and lines its body with them. So what you see is not always what you get. So coccolithophore is a major phytoplankton group. They're characterized by these calcium carbonate coccoliths. They require fewer nutrients. They bloom in warmer water and they may be a dominant few food in a future warmer ocean. They transport significant carbon to the deep ocean and they are vulnerable to acidification, but they don't seem to show the effects of it. And there are abundant fossil accumulations in the rock record in the form of chalk. And with that, we've reached finally the end. Thank you for listening.